Hello again. It's you. Where have you been? Yes. Tis I, Nicholas of Hennigan. How are you doing? And this is the uh, almost, I think this will be the penultimate version of the Maverick Diaries. Extracts of a, a stream of consciousness diary I wrote back in 1997 when Maverick Theatre was a few years old. Uh, I'd written a play called A Ghost of a Chance. Um, it won four awards, featured a television star and a small boy. And I didn't know whether I'd get it on or not. Uh, and as I did, I kept a journal, uh, which uh, which was something I'd done back in 1994 when we first launched Maverick, and it was very successful, so I thought I'd have another crack. Um, as you can see, things are getting to back slightly back to normal now. It's, what is it now, end of July 2020. Uh, most of the lockdown has been lifted here in the UK. Um, I've been down the pub again, uh, and I've had a haircut. So, you know, what more can you say? I would, uh, this time last year, was on my way to the Edinburgh Festival. And I would have been up there as well this year with a new play we've got. But I'll tell you more about that later. Thanks again for getting in touch. It's lovely to hear from you and some people I've not heard from for a long time. All right, Pete. Pete Owen, who knew Doggy Stone? Who knew? Anyway, I won't go on about all that now. Um, if you, yes, if you want to know this whole, this whole book with pictures is available. I'll put the link down here somewhere. Um, and I'm going to start doing some of my radio shows. I'm going to start recording my... Yeah, uh, my radio shows, uh, I do a radio show called Literary London on Resonance 104.4 FM and I'm going to start recording some of them and putting them on the Maverick website and I've got an idea for a short story competition and a thing called the People's Company. We're trying to launch one in West London right now. It started in Birmingham. If it works in West London, I'm going to go back to Birmingham again in time for the Commonwealth Games in 2022. Just thought I'd you know, give you the heads up on that. Okay, okay. In the meantime, we go back to another extraordinary year for us in Maverick, 1997. And you may remember in the last episode, uh, I was up um, and uh, found out that Princess Diana, who we thought was injured, had actually, of course, been killed. And uh, that was where we last left off. Princess Diana uh, passed away. I was quite concerned, of course, that... Um, the gala night, it was only one night. We were only running this play for a week because we couldn't get the venue for any longer. And what happened if Diana's funeral was on the day of our gala night? I was a bit concerned. Let's find out what happened, shall we? Monday, the 1st of September. T minus oh, one less than last time. Ah, oh, blimey. I'm fed up for no apparent reason. Poor, sad, dead, tragic Princess Diana obviously answered my prayers for she is to be buried on the Saturday before A Ghost of a Chance starts. I'm relieved. God has allowed us to live on beyond poor Diana. So why am I fed up? I don't really know. Justin and me went on another scanner hunt tonight with little success due to places closing and me not having a CD-ROM drive in this computer. Later, I sought out the radio mic we need and the gang go down to Hall Green Little Theatre. And then Glenn and me go to town for a beer, for the same reason. There's a subtle disillusionment. It's not the booze, but marking some, any kind of change. I still feel like we're not proper. I'm perched in the kitchen writing this. I don't know. I could mention that John Adams got a bit fed up with a technical problem this morning, but that's not it either. Oh, heck, I don't know. All I do know is that it's been six years since I went on holiday. Me and the girlfriend. And the idea of going anywhere for just the pure pleasure of enjoying yourself for a few days sounds ridiculous. Ah, well. Wednesday the 3rd of September. T minus four days. Not including Monday. Flipping heck. I just read Monday's entry. I think I must have been a bit under the influence. But as this is a stream of consciousness diary, I'll leave it in. I think the cause of the gloom mentioned above was a bad rehearsal day on Monday. Or at least, it wasn't bad, it was just not good, if you see what I mean. Poor, poor Henry's having a job getting all the lines down, which worries me, because I wrote them. Or at least getting them all in the right order. I've written quite a lot of repetition, which makes the play perhaps more difficult to learn. It's a structural thing I've done on purpose, but it's not very kind on the actors. Ha! <laughs> Bloody writers! Paul has a massive part, and because it's a new play, we're cutting and reordering some speeches. And this is his first stage part for seven years. And I know from bitter personal experience that learning lines is something you get better at the more you do. Terrible English, but hey, I don't care. I know I can write better -er if I wanna. We're not in trouble with the production, but I can see the frustration on Paul's face. 
He's producing some brilliant acting, and every time his concentration has to switch from acting to remembering, remembering his performance drops. John Adams, as director, is pushing harder, and when I arrive at rehearsal, the happy atmosphere has changed somewhat. It's still very positive, but there is more of an air of purpose about things. By the afternoon, the jovial banter has returned, but Glenn disappears with Paul into Anthea's space, as we call it, the corridor outside our rehearsal room, after 5.30 to run lines for half an hour. Anthea's space is so named, the bit of corridor between the stairs and the big function room at the Billsby, because that's where the ever-patient parent Anthea Towler sits all day with her book and radio while Justin is rehearsing. She obviously chaperones him. Danny Parr, stage manager extraordinaire from Upper Linda, starts on the crew today as stage manager, props and light and anything else you might want to do. Oh, the joys of small-scale theatre. She's very nice and very lovely, is Danny Parr, and I'm very pleased I'm in a position to be able to pay her properly, thanks to the award money. Having tried to buy a scanner with just on Monday, and having been to a number of outlets, I now feel confident enough to know what I'm looking for. We find one scanner that would do the job in Solihull, only to find they've sold out, but their Leicester branch has 18. This is 7.10pm. Justin immediately starts asking the sales bloke, how long will it take to drive to Leicester? And can we get there before closing time at 8pm? Just and the sales bloke start throwing motorway numbers at each other. I again find myself playing second fiddle to a short 14-year-old. But like all good parents, Justin lets me off the hook. We could probably make it to Leicester, he says, if you hit the gas. But it's up to you. Oh, this kid is a go-getter. I decide that whatever the fate of Ghost of a Chance, I must stay in touch with Doc Towler. He's bound to end up fantastically rich and successful, whatever he does. Like the naughty child I am, I try and pull the, oh, but I told you, Mum, I'd get you home for 8.30, and what if the car breaks down? Card. And knowing the Rover, that's not such a ridiculous statement. The exhaust smoke when cruising on and off the accelerator has got worse. It's now started to frighten HGV drivers. Just is also aware of the Spartan health of my vehicle, and somewhere in the deep recesses of his action now, conquer the world, mind, must lurk the thought that I hide him as an actor, and I must have some sense, therefore, of a grown-up about me. So he lets me off, driving to Leicester. Although I'm not too sure that he was not about to say, the whole bodge over, I'll drive. My adult status with Just probably takes a further battering when I mutter, well, we've got a bit of time to spare. We could always, uh, well, pop into Dave and Buster's. There's a great tank game there, eh? Just allows me to go, and we walk up to the door. The doorman asks if I've been before. I have. The doc hasn't. The doorman then rather foolishly explains to me about the minor rule. Anyone under the age of, uh, anyone under age must be with an over 21-year-old at all times. I resist the temptation to tell the doorman he's probably addressing the wrong person. We go in and almost the first people we've seen, Dave and Buster's, in the restaurant area, are my sister, Fiona, and her daughter, Melissa, my sister-in-law, Mel, and my nephew and niece, Matthew and Tammy. Tammy's 13 and he's just discovering boys, but still comes for a big cuddle. Tam and Matt find Justin something of a novelty, mainly because he's an actor, but partly because he's with Mad Uncle Nick. We decide we'll all play the machines together. Tammy, obviously taken with Justin's looks, quizzes him further about his age. I can't believe he's older than me, Uncle Nick, she says, without malice and with a degree of affection. Tammy's a big girl for her age and Just is small for his, but as I've already mentioned, both here and to Justin, it's a great advantage for a child actor. I wonder how Just feels about being thrust into this domestic whirlwind. I explain Justin's magical status to Tam. Wow, she says, he's an actor. Can I come and see the play? I do the thing of I've learned of, well, you'll have to ask your mum, but she knows me of old. Oh, OK, I'll be there. You'll pick me up, won't you? I can't resist. It's mainly guilt about how bad an uncle I've been. I must spend more time with the family. About four or five years ago, I babysat for my brother, Bob and Mel, one weekend when they had a chance for a weekend away. But to be honest, it would be more accurate to say the kid's uncle sat. Chris, the eldest, then about 15, ended up ordering a taxi uh, for me to get to their house on the first night. Tammy bought me breakfast in bed. Matt and Andy did most of the cooking. All I really did was walk round to the video store with them and blitz the place. I've often done blitzes with my nephews and nieces. We all went to McDonald's one day a few years ago before they, before I uncle sat, or they uncle sat for the weekend. What can we have? said Chris as we entered McDonald's. 
I don't know. What do you want? Everything. Okay, whatever you want. Just don't throw up when you get home. They did have everything, and not one of them got sick. It was fun. Mind you, even our video blitz went a bit wrong. I remember being in Blockbuster with Andy and Tammy, and Andy was walking towards the hire counter with a film, and Tammy said, Uncle Nick, you can't let Andy hire that video. It's an 18, and not only is he not old enough, but I'm in the house as well. It probably would have occurred to me to check the certificate, but I, I hadn't at that point. Not that I was going to let Tam know that. I'm an adult. I tried to find a firm face with which to reproach young Andrew in no uncertain terms. I worked over with a purposeful stride. But before I could utter a word, he stopped, looked at the spine of the film and said, Oh, look, it's an 18. Stupid me. He turned on his heel, replaced the film and grabbed The Jungle Book, which, by the way, I'd not seen before and enjoyed immensely. Back at Dave and Buster's, as the young'uns walk to the games room, Fiona whispers to me, If you're in producer mode with Justin, our kids will soon put him straight about you. You know that, don't you? Well, fortunately, I'm not in producer mode, because as I catch them up, I hear Justin saying to Matt, Yes, I found out that about Nick already. My inquiries as to just what Justin has found out about me, that they already know, is met with wide-eyed innocence and knowing smiles all round. I decide it would be bad form to sulk or stamp my foot, so I head instead for the tank game. So having been schooled by Justy yesterday, I bought a scanner. I cart it in and out of rehearsals to allow the professor to install it on the computer during his breaks. He nearly did today, but with classic Hennigan organisation, the computer battery ran out just as he's about to scan our first picture. I say to Justin that maybe he should read the instruction book, but he throws a cynical look at me and says, Instruction schmuction. And being Justin, he doesn't need the instruction book. I'm just very glad I beat him on the tank game. I go in early this morning for the first run through, which is not a good move because last night Slater and I went to the opening night of a new musical called Keep On Running at the Birmingham Repertory Theatre. <clears throat> it's a brummy version of Carmen, basically. The tickets were courtesy of John James, bless him, who's hosting a bash in the boardroom. The show is really enjoyable, but sadly I don't think it's going to cut the mustard. I wish I could have got my hands on it. I'd have given it some balls. So there. Again, world copyright N. Hennigan. I also wish I had one-tenth of their budget, of course. After the show, we all go to the church nightclub on Broad Street for a buffet, disco and Beatles tribute band. I meet some interesting people, including the manager of the Alexander Theatre. Without really meaning to, I have a great night out. I see John Slater this morning. He slept off at about 1am. He's surprised to see me out of bed. Blimey, I didn't think you'd be in this morning, he says. Last I saw of you, you were dancing with executive producer John Stalker to some 70s disco track. What? Huh? Was I? Oh yes, come to think of it, I probably was. It's now 3.45am Thursday morning. I've got to keep on top of this journal because I must finish it soon. Paul Henry's on BBC Radio WM tomorrow morning, so I must be at Pebble Mill for 10am. I wonder who I'll meet this time. Our gala night is getting ever more important. Partly as a result of last night, Bill Alexander, the Artistic Director of Birmingham Repertory Theatre, is coming, which will be strange with John Adams, a former Artistic Director of the Rep there as well. So too is the Head of TV Drama from BBC Pebble Mill, and John has invited the guy who produced Gene Wilder in the new Neil Simon play in the West End. But everyone is talking about plans for life after the show, and I'm not sure I like it. Justin starts school today, so we won't see him until 4pm. John Adams will be leaving us on Wednesday. Paul is talking about going out with a party of friends on the last night of the show. I got the Up and Under 2 artwork today. Glenn is getting his train ticket back to London tomorrow. And Rob is talking about the new house he and his wife-to-be are moving into the day after the show starts. Danny Parr starts an SM assistant direct at the Midlands Art Centre. Things are moving on. There's a huge, momentous occasion awaiting me over the next few days. But my overriding feeling at this very moment, apart from fatigue, is one of gentle sorrow that the little family we've created around a ghost of a chance is going to break up, probably forever.